Hi, Ninja Nerds. In this video today, we're going to be talking about cranial nerve one olfactory. But before we get started, make sure you go over to ninjanerd.org, check all the notes and illustrations we put out here for you guys. Also, check out our merch that we've got, and then you can also leave a comment down below and don't forget to subscribe. Now, as we talk about the olfactory nerve, we've been going through with neuro, and we've done an overview video of all the cranial nerves. But I wanted to dedicate one video to each nerve to really just nail down the pathophysiology and kind of what's going on and to give a little more clarification. So with the olfactory, we know that it's cranial nerve one and the type is sensory. Because we know that the type is sensory and we know the word olfactory or olfaction, which means smell, the function of cranial nerve one is the sense of smell. You'll see here on this diagram, it looks familiar to our cranial nerve video, where we have our olfactory nerve, which is located right here, this purple one. So we're looking at a posterior view of the brain. We can see that this is anterior here and posterior here, and where we have our olfactory nerve. And we have two, one for the left side, one for the right side. And we're going to take a look here real quick at this diagram that I drew up. We've got this big nose right here, this big honker. And we're going to focus in on this area right in here. How does the olfactory nerve essentially work? What, what's going on with this? So if we think about odorants or smells that are able to fly around, right? They're in the air. We smell them. They eventually go up through into our nasal passages, right? As we take a deep breath in. And when we take that deep breath in, they eventually move all the way up into our olfactory region up here. Okay, so let's take a moment here to identify what we're looking at. We have our olfactory bulb here with our olfactory track and it has all these little axons coming off. And we have the little cilia off the ends here of the nerve in order for us to grab those little odorants. There's little receptors on there, the odorants go on there, they're able to tell us. And there's different types of receptors here so that we have this vast array of smells that we can identify. But for this diagram, I just drew them all in the same color. Just understand that there's many different ones. But the most important thing that we're looking at here is we have this criboform plate of the ethmoid bone, which is right here. They have nice little canals for the nerves to come through. And then we also have the epithelium layer here, which is where the nerves come through and they proju pro uh, project their little cilia out. So those odorants come up in, they eventually interact, if they can, with whatever receptor fits for them, right? Now we have that odorant sending a signal up into the bulb eventually. There's a little more anatomy in there, we don't need to touch on that, that occurs, then eventually sends these messages out into the brain. Different portions of the brain are able to tell us what we're smelling. Great, wonderful. So ideally, it's going to work like that. Odorant's going to come in, it's going to go into the nerve, eventually tell us where it goes to the brain. The brain's going to be able to say, hey, this is what you're smelling, okay? Sensory nerve. There's no movement, there's no motion. That's all that is occurring. So in order for us to assess a patient, if we're going to try to see if their olfactory nerve is working, how would we do that? If the sense of the assessment is to just give them a smell and to identify it, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to give them an identifiable smell. Ideally, it's going to be something that is readily identifiable to people. You hopefully have it around the hospital. We like to use coffee. We like to use cinnamon. We like to use lemon. People like to use the isopropyl alcohol pad. You can if you want. I always think that's a little extreme or a little, little uh, drastic. No one really wants to smell an alcohol pad. And when you assess them, you're just going to have them occlude one nostril, because remember, we have two olfactory nerves, right? So they're going to occlude one nostril, have them close their eyes so they don't cheat, and then have them take a uh, whiff in, and they can identify the scent. If they can, great. If they have trouble, okay, there's something else maybe going on. Then you have them do the same thing on the other side. You might want to change what they're identifying in order to get a good assessment of that olfactory nerve. Now that we understand how we would assess that, what happens if they fail? If they fail, typically there means there's something going on, which we'll explain what some of those causes could be in a second, meaning that they are either having a decrease in smell, hypoosmia, or if they're having a difficulty with smelling, then they're going to also have dysosmia. So osmia means there's a lack of smell, and then you can identify if there's one or the two or the other, if there's a decrease or if there's a difficulty. So that's a word you might see somewhere on some of your patients charting. Just make sure you take a look at it and understand what it is. 
And then the last thing we're going to do is the causes and risk factors. So we talked about a little of the anatomy here. We talked about what's going on. What could cause a patient to have either a difficulty identifying a, spell, a smell, a decrease in the smell altogether. Those can be identified for a couple things. We can look right here. I pointed out before. This is the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone, right? It goes, and then we have the brain cavity up here. So there's any type of head trauma that could cause any type of issue right in here where this bone could either crack or have any swelling around that area. That could be a trigger. Another cause or risk factor for a decrease or difficulty of smelling could be any type of sinus infection. Anything that's going on in here that's causing some swelling, causing some issues, they have some type of sinusitis, anything going on that could be causing some issues with this scent getting out to where it needs to go. We can all think about the times now of COVID when someone has some type of um, infection, they also have a decrease in smell. We can also think of the type of any neurodegenerative disorders, they have any issues with neurons and nerves and things that can be able to send signals. And that is it. That is basically our outlier of how we would say, okay, there's some things going on with this patient. Obviously, if it's head trauma, we're going to try to get some investigation going on, right? Get some imaging. If they have nasal infection, maybe we can get some of the sputum if there's anything. Um, if they're coughing up, look in there, see what else is going on. And then if there's a neurodegenerative order, could also be from medications that they're taking. Want to investigate that further as well. But this at least gives us an area of, okay, we have identified that the assessment has gone wrong. There's something wrong within the assessment. They're failing. They either have a decrease or no sense of smell. What are our pathways that we're going to go down? Are we investigating head trauma? Is there infection? Is there something else going on? So I hope this video made sense. I hope it cleared up a little bit about the olfactory nerve. And as always, until next time.